afternoon. Good evening, uh, everyone. And uh, I hope uh, you have no doubts from the previous class. Okay. So what we are going to do is a continuation of uh, planetary winds. And then we will go on to doing local winds, forms of condensation, and types of rainfall. Uh, for those uh, who are here, if you have been present for my previous classes, if you have any questions, we'll ask them later when all the others join in, so that uh, maybe after uh, I finish with planetary winds, then by then everyone will join in. So you can uh, put up your questions then. Right, so let's begin with planetary winds. Now we have started with planetary winds in the last class yesterday. And we saw how these winds are created because of the formation of pressure belts. And these pressure belts are like alternatively low and high in the northern and southern hemisphere, north of equator and south of equator. And uh, they go by the terms of equatorial low and then they are surrounded by the subtropical high pressure around 30 degrees north and south uh, latitudes. And uh, further north, when we go, we have the 60 degree north and south latitudes where we have the uh, uh, subpolar low. And further north is the northernmost region is the polar high, both in the north and in the south. And because of these high pressure and low pressure conditions, we find that air moves from high pressure to low pressure and therefore winds are created. And we saw how we have these winds moving. They don't come directly, but they come at an angle. And uh, therefore you will find that the uh, names of the wind. So uh, what I did not mention last time is that the names of the winds are mainly because of the direction in which they come because we do not know from where the winds are coming, right? We know from where the winds are coming, sorry, but we do not know where they are going, right? So when we say sea breeze, it means it's coming from the sea. We say land breeze coming from the land. Similarly, if I say northeast trade winds, then they are coming from the northeast, southeast trade winds coming from the southeast and so on and so forth, right? So uh, that's the general information of the winds we saw. So what we are going to do today is a, uh, uh, slightly more uh, information on how these winds are being named, right? So now we have three types of winds, actually. We have planetary or pre prevailing wind, which we already spoke about. Then we have periodic winds. And finally, we have local winds. We've already spoken about some local winds like land breeze and sea breeze, because that is what affects the temperature of a place. And even the other winds also, to some extent, uh, affect temperature of a place. So these are the three types of winds that we have. Let's look at planetary winds. So basically the definition of planetary winds is that they blow throughout the earth from one latitude to another in response to the latitudinal differences in air pressure. Or you could just say because of difference in air pressure. And you can specifically say from high pressure to low pressure areas, right? And they are called planetary because they are found throughout the world, throughout the globe. Okay. And they are called prevailing because they blow throughout the year. They don't stop blowing at any one point of time. Unless, in a, but in a place, you may find a difference in the winds. The reason being that these winds are not stationary. They keep moving, right, with the movement of the sun. I'll do that a little later when we talk about... Uh, uh, India, when I'll be doing India also, climate of India also, so that uh, you can relate to whatever we have studied with reference to India. Though I have given you uh, examples, right, with reference to India, but we will do India in a little more detail because uh, that is what is more important, even for your general studies paper, which is a compulsory paper, right? So prevailing or planetary winds generally found throughout the, uh, the uh, world. And they are given these names, trade winds, westerly winds, and polar winds. Okay, they are the main ones. So we saw yesterday how the entire globe is covered by cells. So we have three cells, Hadley cell next along the equator in the tropical region. Then we have feral cell, right, in the temperate regions. And finally, we have the polar cell. And the cell here actually just means that 
air is moving between these regions. So air begins to move, say, if you say it uh, begins to move from the equatorial low, it begins to move upwards and then it comes down, right, over the subtropical high pressure zones and then and blows as winds into the equatorial low. So that way they, you have the formation of Hadley cell. Similarly, you have the formation of the feral cell and you have the polar cell, right? So let's start with the beginning, which is the equatorial region. Now the equatorial region, the region is called as the doldrums. Now what do you mean by the term doldrum? Doldrum you'll find uh, is located here between five degrees north and south. And you have winds here that, that are not really strong. It's just a light breeze. It's, it's mainly, mostly calm. We say calm, but there are no winds and they are very weak, right? And why do we call it doldrum? Is because uh, they, this is what happens to boats in the sea. So we have a boat here, which is a, called a sailing boat. And the sea is absolutely still. And you can, if you even, even if you open the sails like this, there is no movement of the ship at all. So the ship in the past, in, you know, in the past, the ships were all made up, made up of, of uh, sail ship, sailing vessels. And of course, this is a simple sailing vessel. They were much more complex than this. So the wind used to push the ship. We did not have energy at the, in those days. The only energy that you have, I'm talking of more than 200 years around the first time maybe the Britishers came to India or when trade began, you know, uh, you know, and North America and South America, Australia were not even discovered. Okay, so at that time we had these ships and these ships depended completely on the wind. So they, they can turn the sail depending on which direction they want to go. They have people to do that. And uh, at all the resort done very mechanically, right? And then you'll find the ship will move. But when they, these ships reached the five degree north and south latitudes, then it was absolutely still. There was no wind at all. So to be in a doldrum means, what do we do now? Okay, so what is the reason why it is in a doldrum here? Because there is no wind, it is too calm and there was nothing to push the ship. Of course, much later they would use oars and all, but how much can you push with reference to oars also? So therefore the oars came in much later when they had this problem in another latitude also, right? And so this is your doldra. But the, uh, at the present day, every three to about three to five years, you will find that the wind here or the uh, yeah wind here becomes a little more strong and it is called as the equatorial westerlies. So it is moving in the same direction as the uh, rotation of the earth. Okay. And uh, uh, so, and they are not affected by Coriolis force. As I told you, these winds are uh, in, I mean, uh, the, the uh, Coriolis force at equator is zero, right? And therefore you'll find that they just blow from land to sea and sea to land right across the region in the right across the globe and they are called as equatorial westerlies, right? So you need to know the name between five degree north and south. You need to know the latitudes. This is called as equatorial westerlies as well as you need to know that this region is called as a doldra, right? Next, we move on to the trade winds. So the trade winds blow from 25 degrees north and south to five degrees north and south of the equator in each hemisphere. So 25 degrees to 5 degrees and north and 25 degrees south to 5 degrees south uh, in the southern hemisphere. Okay. And these bring rain to the east coast because they are coming from the easterly direction. They uh, actually hit more of the east coast and therefore they bring rain because wherever they are blowing from the sea to the land, they will bring rain. And that is why you will find so uh, yesterday when we were talking about deserts, uh, I did not mention because I thought you may be uh, confused. So I, I should mention it here that that is the reason why the West Coast is mainly dry. Okay. And you have deserts being located on the West Coast. Right. So deserts are not located completely in the subtropical high pressure zone, which is 
around 30 degrees, right? So the reason being that the northeast trade trade winds and the southeast trade winds, these winds bring um, rainfall to the eastern coast of every continent wherever they blow in, and as they go interior, it becomes dry, and therefore the western region will all be extremely dry. The only uh, exception here is Sahara Desert. The reason being that Sahara is completely landlocked in the east. There is no there is no sea in the east. There's a very tiny sea which is a Red Sea, okay. And then there are quite high mountains actually in this region. Most of them volcanic mountains or, or even generally mountains, highland region. So the interiors are always dry, okay. And just across the Red Sea is again the Arabian Desert, right? So the Arabian Desert, again, it's completely landlocked, okay? The sea is a very small sea, the Gulf of Oman that you have there, and then is India. So starting from India, if you move towards the west, the whole region right across Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries, as well as Africa, is a hot desert region. So the eastern part of India is not a hot desert. It is. It has a lot of rainfall. It has more than... 50 to 60 centimeters of rainfall bordering the Thar Desert. And as you go further east, the, the rainfall increases. So that, of course, is because of the monsoon. And the monsoon is related to the trade winds. Okay. But they are not prevailing winds. They are periodic winds. So here is just what you need to remember, the latitudes that you need to remember, that the wind blows from 25 degrees to 5 degrees north and south, right? And like I told you, it is called as the Northeast and Southeast Straits. So the reason why it was called, it is called these winds because they favor trade in the past. So if you see the world map, okay, right, no. If you see the world map, maybe I should have put a world map here. Uh, and if you can just imagine the maps we saw yesterday, uh, you can say that from England for a ship to start sailing, it would have to go into the Atlantic Ocean. And from the Atlantic Ocean, it would then cross the equator. And then when it would cross the equator, it would have a problem at the equator. And at that time, there was no Suez Canal. Okay, so then they would go right round to South Africa, around the Cape of Good, uh, Good Hope, right? Uh, so, uh, when Suez Canal is in the news, so you should know about it, if you're keeping up to date with uh, current affairs, right? So Suez Canal was built very much later. And then these ships would go right across there. And therefore, it takes a very long time. So they initially would have a problem from their own country because you have the westerly winds blowing there. And the winds would actually push them more towards their own land rather than downwards. But then somehow they managed to make that. And they uh, reached, uh, say, the equator which is around the equatorial region, then they have the doldrums and then they had to wait. And then much later when the winds begin to uh, come in about 10 days or a week, depending on the time they have reached that area, then they would move down. So that time the northeast trade winds would blow them, right? And the, uh, we have, so northeast trade winds to the equator. And as, after they've reached the equator, then you have the southeast trade winds. So southeast trade winds again would help them a little bit to some extent to go uh, to go uh, further south. But if they were in the monsoon season, they would be lucky. They would have the northwest winds, okay, uh, that would blow, uh, help them to uh, blow the ships and uh, the sails, and they would reach Cape of Good Hope. By the time they reached Cape of Good Hope, remember, all this is very, very slow, maybe three, four, five, six months, okay. And then at the Cape of Good Hope, again, you have the winds, the southeast trade winds, pushing them up right into the uh, equatorial region and past the equatorial region. The monsoon winds would then begin the southwest monsoon winds, right? And they would reach India, they would reach China, they would reach Indonesia and all these countries. So therefore, and even on the way back, they would know when the, I mean, know when to begin their journey. So they'd begin the journey in December in from Asia, right? Because remember, these are the only continents they knew. They did not know about uh, North America and South America and Australia. So the only continents they knew were these two. 
and therefore the winds they would they knew when the winds would begin they've kept a record of that and they would help them so that is why these winds are known as the trade winds so at all points of time the uh, a large area right was covered with the help of the, these winds and the ship also would move faster than till they reach the equatorial region where it would be, become slow down again right so that is why they are called as the trade winds right so the next picture that you see here is a picture of another very calm area again it's a sailing vessel is a sailing um, boat and you can see there is a horse is a, uh, this thing of a horse is uh, being you know pushed down pushed out from the ship so this is actually a painting because nobody really took pictures in those days so what were happen much later when uh, north america was discovered so north america was discovered before south america so the moment it was discovered of course the ship that went to discover north america was a small boat and they actually went as close as possible to uh, the land like from a new it started from norway sweden and then it went to uh, iceland and then from iceland to greenland and then greenland they reached the continent of north america but christopher columbus took a different route he decided he'll just get into a boat and just travel in the west because the world is he knew by then that the earth is round and he knew that if he tra travel west he will definitely find a new sea route to india but in the process of traveling there and then therefore they discovered north america once north america was discovered then uh, the people there initial people who went there they started exploring the region they found it is a rich region where agricultural resources were concerned the soil was good okay and everything was good there but the only problem they faced is lack of transport they did not have any form of transport remember this was before the industrial revolution so at this point of time they only had the use of horses and they didn't find a single horse on the east coast of north america not a single horse so then they decided that they will bring the horses from europe now where were horses being uh, uh, what do you call uh, domesticated and uh, looked after just like cows and and buffaloes was the southern part of europe kazakhstan southern russia right in those days it was soviet union so those countries or those areas where are where where you had a whole lot of horses because horses took the place of cows like in india it was cows horses did all the work there right in terms of uh, farming in terms of transport right and therefore they were breeding horses and selling them to northern europe and western europe so they decided okay on our next trip back we will bring a shipload of horses now this was in the southern part of the uh, in uh, the uh, uh, atlantic ocean okay and what happened here was that after filling the ships with horses while they were going in the in the southern part north of the equator only around 25 degree 30 degree north okay this is maybe around 30 35 degree north they started to move again in the same direction in order to reach north america and they realized that they had the same problem that they had in the uh, doldrum region that the ship just would not move so initially they thought that the ship did not move because it was too heavy and so they actually tried to lighten the ship by throwing horses overboard into the sea a very cruel thing to do but that was the order to lighten the ship and therefore but then it was not happening that is why these regions are called as the horse latitude so this is actually the high pressure belt they are known as the anti trades okay and they are located in the subtropical high pressure as we saw subtropical high pressure is a region where air is coming down okay and in a particular season especially in summer it is located around 30 to 35 degree north right and again southern hemisphere summer it will go down to the south and therefore you will find here that the wind there were no winds here and therefore it was against trading in in every aspect also you have the 
uh, westerly winds that are further up, you have westerly winds that blow you in the opposite direction. They are not going to blow you towards, you want to travel towards the west, but there is a wind that is coming from the west and blocking you and pushing you back from where you came. And so they thought that if they go, go down further, right in the belt of calms, right, they would have a better chance. But then they found that they, there was no wind there. The no wind was mainly because they are a zone of high pressure. So when you have high pressure, it is calm, it is clear, there are no clouds in the sky, right? And somehow, so that's when they developed the oars, the long oars they attached. They picked up uh, slaves from Africa and the slaves were made to row the boats, basically, right? And they managed to solve this problem to some extent, right? So that is the anti-trades, which is called as the horse latitudes and located between 30 to 35 degree north and south latitude. Okay. Then we have what we call as the prevailing westerlies. So prevailing westerlies are pretty strong winds, especially in summer. In winter, it is not so strong. Obviously, because the land, it will be cooler and therefore there will be a high pressure over the land. And though there is high pressure over the sea, right, the winds will blow in. Uh, which is slightly higher, the winds will blow in actually very, uh, what do you call, uh, I mean, at less speed, right? But otherwise, in summer, they are extremely strong winds. Located 35 to 55 degrees north. So, which is this area in Europe? In Europe, this area starts from northern Spain, includes France, Germany, and then you can go up to UK, Norway, and Sweden, southern parts of Norway and Sweden. This entire belt is from 35 to 55 degrees bordering the ocean and the winds blow in always throughout the year. That's why they are called as the prevailing westerlies coming from the west, actually southwesterlies in the north and northwesterlies in the south. And that's how they blow in, right? And they bring rainfall also to this particular region, right? So this is a region that where you will have rain throughout the year, okay? And uh, they are just known as the westerlies. There is just no other term for it. But in the southern hemisphere, they are called by special names. Okay. So what is different between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere? Between 35 and 55 degrees no, no, latitudes. So in the northern hemisphere, you have lots of land. But in the southern hemisphere, there is no land south of 35 degrees. So between uh, Arctic Ocean, uh, sorry, the Antarctic Southern Ocean, right, covering the Southern Ocean and a part of the Atlantic Ocean, right, south of South America, south of South Africa, right, south of even Australia and parts of New Zealand. So here is where you will find that we have special names for these westerlies, right. The first name is called as the Roaring Forties between 40 and 50 degree latitudes, only in the southern hemisphere. So the winds, there's nothing to stop the winds to blow. Summer, winter, autumn, spring, throughout the year, the winds blow at a very high speed, right? And I believe you can hear them roar. So they have given the name of roaring 40s. Okay, then we have the furious 50s, between 50 and 60 degree south latitudes. These are all in the south and the shrieking or screaming 60s between 60 and 70 degree south latitudes. Now, when would they have discovered these winds? These winds would have been discovered only when they discovered when beyond Australia. So once they reach Australia, they would not have come across these winds. But once Antarctica was discovered, right, and Antarctica was easy to discover once they discovered South America. Because the tip of South America, there is a whole lot of small islands. So a ship can actually go from one island to another island. And as they kept on going for adventure sake, this is just for adventure sake, then they discovered Antarctica. So, but when they discovered Antarctica and they said, okay, let's try to go to Antarctica from another point, not from South America, but let us go straight from UK straight across the Atlantic Ocean, straight into, uh, uh, into Antarctica, you will find the continent of Antarctica. You will find that they came across very, very strong winds. 
by then they had already uh, had steamships so you didn't have uh, sailing vessels then the steamships came in because that was soon after industrial uh, revolution so steamships came in but even though steamships were not able to take the it was actually if you want to go they wanted to cut across the these winds and the winds would just hit them and remember when you have strong winds in the in the ocean you also have high uh, what you call waves okay so these strong winds that we have here are basically uh, uh, this uh, what do you call uh, yeah uh, blowing from the west that's why they are called westerlies okay and they blow from one second they blow from uh, west to east and so anybody going towards that direction you will find it was impossible for them to cross right and the only way to go to antarctica today is through those little islands off the coast of of uh, south america right they hop skip and jump those islands and they could they're not affected that much then of course you fly down today you uh, you can fly down into the region okay so this question comes very often right roaring 40s 40 to 50 degree south latitude furious 50s 50 to 60 and screaming or shrieking 60s in 60 to 70 only found in the southern hemisphere because in this zone right there are no there is no land at all right and that is why you have these strong winds blowing there and they are still the westerly winds okay at least up to 60 degrees they are westerly winds and then you have the polar easterlies that are uh, set in between 60 to 70 okay right so polar easterlies now so they are cold winds but they are weak winds so why are they weak winds is because they are come just flowing out from the polar region towards a not very strong low pressure zone in the subpolar region so the subpolar region as i told you yesterday is created the low pressure is created mainly because of the spinning of the earth and the lifting off of air okay so the actual low there is not much because even though the earth is spinning like at, at a very great speed you will find that the uh, uh the uh, uh, what do you call uh, the the uh, deflection of the winds is not very strong right and so the air sort of is able to be pushed up enough to cause a low pressure enough to pull in air from the surrounding region right and therefore these are weak winds so polar easterlies are extremely weak winds they flow off off the surface right towards the warmer latitude so what do you think they will do to the temperature obviously they are going to decrease the temperature of these places more important is that they create what we call as the mid latitude cyclones so when they meet the warm winds coming from the subtropical high pressure and they form into what we call as a front so there is like one they are locked up we're going to do types of rainfall hopefully today we can understand this better then right and so they are the ones that cause this particular uh mid latitude cyclones right that come mainly in just after summer okay and uh, uh just like in india we have these uh, cyclones that are developed just after summer just after the monsoon region season same here we also have these uh cyclones developing at this particular time so october november towards winter you will find is when you have the formation of these uh cyclones okay finally we have this periodic winds so periodic winds are basically winds that change their direction periodically so we have two important periodic winds one is the monsoon and one is the land and sea breeze so the monsoon is definitely has a greater time when it changes direction so it takes close to about 3 months it remains in one direction then there is a break and another 3 months it comes in another direction so that's why they are called as periodic winds land and sea breeze happen every day especially in summer more in summer than in any other season in winter you will not have so much of a land and sea breeze it will be very mild except in the tropical region because in the tropical region it is always hot so but it is not that hot right so land and sea breeze come in and they may change in terms of intensity with reference to season 
But summer is when you have uh, the maximum velocity of land and sea breeze and it comes in and covers a larger area of coastal places, right? And we have done that also. So before we go on to that, we, let's go on to what we call as local winds. Any questions up to this point? Are there any questions uh, anyone has? I think it's pretty simple up to this point. Uh, there's a lot of data to remember here, right? To memorize rather, I would say. Uh, to uh, and uh, in terms of the name numbers of the latitude and the names of the winds, but then you may, you have done it in uh, school geography, so you would sort of it would be some kind of a revision for you, right? Right. So let's move on to local winds. Now, local winds here are. I'm just going to take a sip of. We spoke about local winds yesterday, right? The first local wind is your sea breeze, right? And we have understood, I think, the concept of sea breeze, how you have warm air rising up and cooler moving air comes, comes in, right? So when does this actually happen? So we look at the explanation. So that's in the, this happens at two o'clock in the afternoon. And this one happens at around one o'clock at night, right? So when you have cold air sinking in, it becomes warm. It's not really, doesn't remain cold, it remains warm. So when the air, land temperature decreases, then the air just sinks down. The, by then the sea is already warm and then you have a low pressure. So air moves off and the air moves up, more air will come down, right? And warm up. So land breeze early morning is quite warm and sea breeze is quite cool, right? Then we have the catabatic and anabatic winds. So... In, the, uh, in this case, we need a mountain range. I've also spoken about this in the, in the previous class, right? So, catabatic K for cold again. So, when you have a region surrounded by mountains, especially if you're in a valley and you have hills around you, and high hills, not very uh, low hills, high mountains, especially 900, 600, 900 meters minimum, but if it's more than that, it's better. Then you'll find that at night, due to gravity, cold air will come down the valley and it will appear to be like a wind, right? And uh, as it comes down, it will displace the warm air in the valley and it will create a specific condition known as inversion of temperature. So remember, I had told you that temperature in the normal environment decreases as you go upwards but in such a condition the cold air is below and the warm air is pushed up it is displaced right and therefore now you will find that you have uh, temperature will increase as you go upwards right so this is very important for people who plan to develop and live in places in the valley mostly they will never stay in the valley they will stay on the lower slopes of the mountain because the, this is what, what will happen is that it will become extremely cold, okay? And though the temperature of that uh, uh, when, uh, air that is coming down will be slightly warmer, okay? It will still be much colder than what we can expect, especially in the colder latitudes or even in the Himalayas. It happens in the Himalayas. So you, you must be aware of what is called as the cold wave in northern India in winter. But that cold wave is happening only because of this, uh, you know, uh, the, the land anyway is cold, the sun's rays are not very strong, so already temperatures are down. And then we have gravity bringing down more cold air, especially from the middle and the out, you know, outer Himalayas, the Shivaliks, they come down and they settle down in the plains and create your cold wave, right? And then of course we have added to the problem by because we burn uh, fires in order to keep warm, we burn our agricultural land and all that smoke then becomes smog and we create all these complications for ourselves. And of course, the transport industry has also added to more pollutants in this region. So this has always been there for centuries, but man's activities have actually complicated it. So this is exactly what happens and it is known as a mountain breeze or a catabatic breeze. Now, during the day, what happens is that the air ground, of course, is warmer 
and therefore the air is warmer and that begins to rise up right and therefore they are able it goes up and uh, it warms up the upper places so if you have your uh, village somewhere halfway then you won't be affected too much by these catabatic and anabatic winds okay and uh, so th this is now a local wind because it's only found in the mountainous areas where you have mountains valleys okay so there is one uh, interesting that hap thing that happens for people who are uh, climbing mount everest so they begin the climb after 3 am in the morning the reason is that the climb is not going to be affected by because at that moment of time all the air has come down there is no movement the, the probably the air pressure here has been equated and therefore you'll find they are easily able to climb up without being pushed by the wind from below okay or being you know or being pushed from the wind from above so that is why the climb to mount everest begins around 3 am the from the last camp right they go from one camp one base level to another level so the last level is where they will not they will not go during the day because during the day it the uh, uh, it will become the ice sort of melts a bit and it is foggy and you may not be able to see where you are going okay but at night time it's all clear okay because all the cold air is sort of settling down there's no movement and it on a moonlight night it's even better so you can see your way through right and uh, go up the mountain so that's with reference to your catabatic and anabatic again here k for cold coming in from the mountains and a is for when the opposite of that anabatic is for warm coming in coming down the mountain okay right so so here is another one right so how temperatures are going to increase uh, as you go downwards and then of course there is a circulation within the zone and it's a small zone it's not a, a, a already the valley will be at a height of 1000 2000 meters and the hill top could be another 4000 5000 meters depending on where you are right so there could be a circulation within the region like say within the two himalayan three himal uh, himalayan ranges right even rockies has several parallel ranges so places in between of course they have more of rivers flowing there but uh, they are they are actually quite dry because they don't even get much rainfall but in india it's a different story the monsoon bring in the rain and uh, the rain can come in into these valleys because there are a lot of gaps in the outer range which is the shivalik range okay right so this is the daytime uh, what's happening during the day and that what's happening at night okay right then i told you about these winds called the chinook winds so chinook winds begin is basically the westerly winds so we have westerly winds blowing along the west coast of north america and like i told you these regions are bordered by the high rocky mountains right from alaska as you come down south following the coast into south america right where then they are called as the andes <clears throat> so the air is forced to rise okay so this is say in in uh, 10 degree celsius means it is in winter and as it rises up moisture is lot lost you may get light rainfall which is the light rainfall you get in the mediterranean zone also and then as it goes up you'll find that uh, because condensation means cooling and cooling means loss of heat right so heat is added to it but then gradually that heat is sort of lost and by the time they reach the mountain top they are minus 12 degrees right so 10 degrees to 12 degrees is because of the heat that is added because moisture is lost then when they come down they increase in temperature much more from minus 12 degrees to 18 degrees celsius so if you have crops there on the ground especially in summer then you will find that the temperatures will be higher in summer and therefore the crops can dry up and uh, completely yes it will be just burnt out but what is good about it is that in winter when the cold air comes in from the arctic these warm winds because i told you yesterday remember that the rocky mountain is parallel to the coming from north to south right 
and therefore the arctic winds actually are uh, welcome to move from the arctic region right across the central parts of america right up to south america usa especially which is a tropical region right so in winter there should be snow on the ground but then the chinook manages to make the snow disappear which is the name meaning of the word chinook which is called as snow eater right so that's how it works so the winds coming in from the west going into canada and usa blocked by the rocky mountains that is called as the leeward side of the mountains and windward so windward is where the winds are coming in and leeward is the opposite side and that entire region becomes warm right or is meant kept warm there is not that much of cold there and that is what it is called so chinook could be a southern or western wind moist air blows from the pacific towards rocky mountains then as it rises it cools to form into clouds and this may cause rain on the western side of the mountains as the air sinks on the other side on the leeward side it increases in temperature and becomes dry it is then called as chinook okay chinook is a strong wind and uh, it also is known as a snow eater these are the effects of the snow so it is an indian name meaning indian meaning not our indian but the red indian okay the red indians were the small tribe that lived in uh, one of the small tribes that lived in north america uh, in in those in those early days before when north america was discovered right and you have other smaller uh, tribes like inuit and laps further up north near the polar region okay we'll talk about that later maybe if we have the time right so in summer it causes the crop to dry up or burn out when it develops over the european alps it is called as cone winds right and it improves so cone winds here are improve improve the uh, surrounding this is switzerland this is one warmer part of switzerland which is then able to have because it has so much of grass it has a whole lot of cows and because it has a lot of cows it has a lot of milk and the milk then is used to and they buy cocoa from africa from ghana and uh, they make chocolate so swiss chocolate and swiss dairy and swiss cheese is famous only because of this particular wind okay so this wind comes in here this way right this is the entire region that is affected by that westerly winds coming in and you have what you have a mountain range here which is called as the alps now unlike himalayas which is east west or the or rockies and andes which is north south the Him uh, alps are all Uh, like bunched up they're all like you know in one place in a circular manner so when the winds come in and they go up so the western slopes right may be very cold when the wind comes in, in especially in winter and as it climbs up it becomes even colder but as it comes down you'll find that it warms up so even though you may not have enough sunlight the warmth of the wind will make the snow disappear in some areas like of course if you have a south aspect slope here it will also be better and therefore you have those meadows so that's that's the greenery you see that remains green throughout the year doesn't get covered with snow even in winter which is why they are able to carry out uh, the uh, uh, making swiss chocolates and um, and uh, dairy products and so on right so that's known as the fohn winds f o e h n okay so this is uh, yeah this is again your uh, other winds small other winds that blow out of the region okay and down south in the green you can see other santa ana winds so these winds actually cause a lot of problem for the uh, coastal regions so it is just because these mount some in some parts of these mountain ranges it's extremely high so the cold air does not cross the mountain it comes down the mountain and as it comes down the mountain it then heats up right and it generally happens just at the end of your winter right and that's when the fires begin so many of these winds they are called as the sundowner the chin chinook of course crosses uh, the mountains but other other winds you'll find they blow downwards 
Some of them increase in temperature, the others may not be that high in temperature because you don't have forest fires that high up, okay? Only in the southern part here, where you can see the term uh, Santa Ana, that is where you have the maximum number of fires, right? You do have some fires there, but they're not, because the height of the, um, uh, the mountains there is not much, but the highest mountains are in the southern part here. And that's how you'll find you have the winds blowing here. So that's the Santa Ana, right in that part of the US, mainly in the southern part, south, uh, let us say southwestern part of US, which is the region that is called as California, okay? And this is the fire. So this is now, uh, I mean, something that they are not able to stop. Year after year, you have the fires. The fires are becoming more and more uh, uh, dangerous and uh, widespread, okay? This year, uh, we, even Australia has had the same condition. It has been worse this year. And the only reason for that is that temperatures have increased, okay? So this is one of the aspects of global warming where all these things will become more extreme in nature. So remember, if, uh, if the air is warmer and hotter, it will rise up also very quickly. And when it rises up very quickly, it will cool down very quickly. And then when it cools down quickly, within a short distance, it has become like uh, it has released, uh, condensation will happen and it releases all that heat. And again, it starts to warm up. And then it doesn't warm up that much. It's still very cold and it does come sliding down and then increases again in temperature. So there are just pockets of air coming down this way, right? To create these forest fires. And this is the Santa Ana. So you don't have to learn the entire list. It's just a few names that you have to learn for uh, your prelims. Previously, they used to ask a lot of questions on this. But uh, now you don't need to know that many here. Right, so that's your actual, uh, these are trees grown by man and uh, they everything just burns down in this. And remember, this is an earthquake prone region. Many houses here are built of wood. Okay, though the in the city you have multi-story buildings and so on and so forth, but many houses built of wood. And so uh, in those suburban areas and everything just burns out. Then finally, you have one more wind called the mistral. So the mistral is mainly a wind that blows in the Mediterranean region from northern Spain, okay, to northern Italy. What, what mountain range do we have here? We have the Pyrenees. So the Pyrenees mountain range here, right? And the air that comes in or blows into this region is again the westerlies. And as they go up, they, they, they dry up and you'll find that they, uh, the wind just keeps blowing for a lot of time. Now, one strange thing happens here is that sometimes the wind is so strong that it creates a whole lot of uh, uh, problems in the ocean. So they have some ports built along this region and the ships are not able to come into the port because the waves... The wind is so strong that the wave just pushes the ship and it cannot remain anchored and they have many serious problems here. So for many days, the, the ship just remains outside because remember the wave becomes stronger only along the coast. Out at sea, the waves may not be that high, but as you come to the coast, the waves become stronger. So many ships are stuck outside of these areas. But then this is the most, uh, what we call as commercial uh, a part of the world, a lot of things being, um, uh, I mean, traded, right? right? Starting from fish and, and uh, fruits and, you know, things that are not there in other parts of the world you find here, right? So a lot of trading happens in this region and oil, of course, uh, the African region has oil, uh, crude oil. So that's where you find the ports are very important, right? So it's very strong in winter, right? Uh, because the southern part is still hot. This is the southern part of the Mediterranean region. And uh, the temperatures are not that low in winter. Of course, this year, the whole of the Mediterranean region became uh, covered with snow. If you remember, I think it Italians and Sp Spanish people had snow on the, on the ground for after a very long time. That was mainly because of the Arctic uh, blast. That is air 
uh, like coming out from the Arctic region and you know, going right down. And nothing to stop it. It's all plains, flat region. And, not, and through the valleys, you'll find that uh, they come down like this, right? And since it is dry, it evaporates the clouds and therefore the areas become extremely sunny. So it's nice for people who are living there. In winter, they at least have some sunlight. Otherwise, you'll find it can become uh, quite tedious for them because it's always raining in these regions throughout the year. Okay. Then we move on to India and that is the loo wind. So the loo wind here is a strong, hot and dry summer wind. And these winds blow from the Thar Desert into the western Indo-Gangetic plain of North India and Pakistan. Okay, so why are these winds created is because you have, uh, yeah, especially strong in the month of May and June. So they are created mainly, I told you, you have hot air, uh, I mean, coming down. It's a, it's a pressure, high pressure zone. So air is coming down and summer is already set in around the region. Okay, away from this region. So in those areas, a low pressure is created. So in the Thar Desert itself, like bordering the Ar Arali range and the other areas there, you find a low pressure is created. And this high pressure, therefore, wind comes from the high pressure and blows outwards. So the surrounding region, which is a, a, a wetter area, okay, therefore, it, it has uh, higher temperatures in summer because there is, a, a, I mean, a, like a, you could say, uh, they are near the plains like Punjab, Haryana on that side and you have Pakistan areas on this side on the west. So north Punjab, Haryana, south Gujarat. So these are in the slightly more wetter regions. But the actual low pressure in, in the Thar Desert area is high pressure zone then becomes more intensified in May and then it moves outwards. And that's why in May, June you have a whole lot of uh, things happening here. So trees completely shed their moisture in, in the surrounding region, not in this region. In this region, there are no trees and uh, they are only have cactus vegetation. And this is generally accompanied by dust storms. So we're almost 15, 10 to 15 days, around uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the wind will start blowing and will bring all the dust from the desert into these regions. And nobody can step out at that time. Okay, so uh, I grew up in these areas uh, as a child and every year we would be affected by this and we could not go out. And sometimes you would have an occasional rainfall, thunderstorm, hailstorm, okay, and uh, everything would be quiet for a few days and again then the uh, wind would blow and all the sand will come into the house. No matter what we do, close all the gaps in the windows and all the fine sand will collect. By the time it goes off and you open, you can't even open your door because there's so much of sand collected outside also, right? And so these were serious issues that we had uh, where we stayed. That is in the Kutch region of Gujarat, okay? Right, so this is the loo region. Now they've shown this loo a little, there's a big mistake here, a bit, but I wasn't able to get any other important thing. So the loo it does not extend right up to the eastern part. It just stops now, uh, uh, to western part of Uttar Pradesh, that's it. So half that region, you have to cut it off. Uh, so uh, I need to learn how to do all this. So, so that's a loo, loo, loo uh, that you have on the map. But it's only the northwestern part. So north of uh, Gujarat and north, the whole of Rajasthan, Punjab, Haryana, Delhi, uh, and some parts of Agra, and Noida in uh, Uttar Pradesh, that's uh, that area alone. The rest of it is the river Ganga and uh, you have a lot of crops growing there, so you don't have any issues there. Okay, so that's the loo and that's the local winds that you need to know. So again, a few new terms because some of them are foreign. So the only way you can learn it is to keep revising it, keep looking at it at uh, from in uh, PPTs and. Uh, when you're looking at the internet, you need to be careful that you are looking at the correct information. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's the reference to local winds. Uh, any questions here? This is all pretty simple. Okay, 
and relevant also where your IAS is. And it also, uh, yeah, so some concepts, same concepts is repeated a bit more this today, but I hope it was uh, better, more simpler, right? Next is major forms of condensation. So we move with from uh, uh, movement and pressure and all and go on to humidity. Okay, so that the only form of humidity we can see is in the form of drops of water and that's why we call them as major forms of condensation. Right, so what are the forms? First form that everybody sees here is a cloud, right? And the cloud is up above in the sky. Unless you are also like at a height of, of a say, you are on uh, in Uti or Kore Canal and therefore then you're surrounded by the cloud. But uh, otherwise you'll find that if you're at ground level, generally even in Bangalore, the clouds are still above us, right? Then we have something called mist of fog, which is again a kind of cloudy, uh, cloudy uh, uh, type which is near the surface of the earth. So if a cloud is formed or condensation happens near the surface of the earth in the lower levels of the troposphere, right? Then we call that as mist or fog. Mist if the visibility is more and fog if the visibility is less, right? Then we have frost and dew. So frost and dew here is found at the surface of, of the earth. So anything that is there on the surface of the earth, it will form first into dew and then into frost. Okay, the dew will freeze and then become frost. So they, that's why they are one and the same, right? And they have to form on some surface. They have to, that is basically condensation happening on the surface. I think I've already explained to you earlier what is condensation, I have mentioned it. Basically, condensation is the uh, change from water vapor to water because of cooling. And why does cooling happen? The cooling happens mainly because uh, either in the upper, uh, in the upper area, uh, area of the atmosphere, it happens because the air is less dense. In the lower area, it will happen because the ground suddenly becomes very cold because it has lost all its heat, right? And if it loses its heat very quickly, then you'll find you have more better conditions for the formation of mist, fog, and frost, and dew. Okay, right. So formation here, basically cooling should happen. And then air holds less water when there is cooling happening. Uh, relative humidity increases. So what is relative humidity? Is the We have something called as absolute humidity and relative humidity. So humidity is basically the amount of water vapor, not water droplets, water vapor found in the air, okay? And this water vapor, if it is, if you measure that water vapor in actual grams, okay, there are instruments to do that, then that is called as absolute humidity. But then when you compare the amount of uh, water found in a particular volume of air at a particular temperature to the maximum amount of water vapor that can be held by that volume of air at the same temperature, then that is called as relative humidity. It is like your uh, exam. Your exam has 100 marks. That means that's a maximum. And you are getting uh, 60 marks. So then you get 60%. So you have scored 60% in, in that, uh, in, 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 yeah. So everybody has the same marks of 100, correct? So the standard here is that unit volume of air. That's the standard. Now, the second standard here is the temperature. Now, the temperature may increase or decrease. So when the temperature increases, it means there will be more evaporation. If, temperature, if uh, there is more evaporation, there will be more water vapor, right? Till at a particular time when you have maximum water vapor at that particular temperature, okay? So therefore, that is what we call as absolute humidity. But it's not possible for the air to be completely 
uh, humidified, uh, completely fill like that at a particular temperature. It is possible because after that point is where you have the dew point where you have water vapor becoming water, right? So that is what we call as, uh, if anything that is less than that, it is called relative humidity. And it is, uh, it is uh, what you call measured in a percentage. So I will do a, a separate chapter if required. It's not really important for uh, IA's purposes, but just to understand a bit, if you want later on, we can do a small, if we have time, we can deal with humidity. So relative humidity is just the amo actual amount of water vapor in air, okay, at a particular temperature, which is not the, the absolute amount, okay, not the maximum amount. So we just call it as, so whenever we have uh, cooling, then you'll find that the air will have a temp uh, ability to increase the amount of water being held, right? And that is why you have uh, relative humidity. So relative humidity is basically water vapor. So it is 100% when moisture is released, right? Then moisture is released. And that is what we have when we have condensation. So for condensation to happen, relative humidity should be 100%. Okay. So this is now frost. This is on the ground, deposition of water on the ground. And of course, dew. This is again frost. This is a frost on the plants. Okay. Early morning, it, it can be seen. This is dew on a spider web. You can see dew on plants and grass on the road, uh, on the on the car, your car will appear, or your vehicle, say two-wheeler, whatever you kept outside. And if you're, if you're outside, even you will become, you will feel the wetness, right? If you're sleeping outside, then your bed, bed and your, everything becomes damp, and that is dew, okay? Then the difference between frost and dew. So dew is water drops, dew point is less than, uh, greater than zero degrees. And when it is frozen, so dew point is, equal to or less than zero degrees, then that becomes frost. So dew is drops of water and frost is frozen dew. Like it, uh, it, it has to go through the process. First, it has to be water and then it becomes frozen and becomes frost. Then you have fog and mist. So clouds near the ground. So mist, like I said, is condensation happening close to the ground and therefore it looks cloudy, but you can easily look through the mist, your uh, uh, this your what called visibility will be about one kilometer or so. But you can see that it is all hazy. There is also another word haze, which is even lighter. Okay. Then we have fog, where the you cannot see anything at all. Right. Visibility is almost zero. Okay. And uh, fog is uh, created if if as and when condensation increases at ground level. So in India, we have fog mainly in the northern plains and only during the winter season, right? But mist we have right across the country. Okay, even Bangalore has mist. Chennai never has mist. Where, uh, where the temperatures are really high, that those places, even in winter, you will very rarely, you have to get up very early in the morning to see the mist. Uh, or you may even see a haze. Haze is even thinner than a mist, right? But fog is generally found where the temperatures are much lower, can drop uh, really low. After especially a very hot day and the nighttime temperatures decrease rapidly, that's when you are likely to have fog. Okay, So sometimes they give you the weather report on your app and they say you have fog in, uh, in Bangalore in certain areas and, and you go out and say it's absolutely clear. So I don't know on what grounds they are making such a, uh, what do you call, uh, this, I mean, uh, uh, interpretations, okay? So anyway, so anyway, there are five types of fog. This is just for information. One is what is called as a radiation fog. Now radiation, as the name suggests, that the heat is lost very quickly in straight, in straight wave, wavelength waves from the ground to the sky. So for that, the sky has to be clear you should have a high relative humidity and the ground air should cool faster, right? So that it be cold air below and you have warm air above, which is called as 
temperature inversion. Remember, I just talked about it. So temperature inversion happens in two ways. One, if you have cold air coming down from surrounding mountains and it displaces the warm air from the valley, then you'll find as you go up now, temperatures will increase instead of decreasing. But there is one strange thing that happens in the atmosphere because it cools very rapidly. So the hot air rises very quickly so that the ground is covered with cold air. And then this hot air sometimes as it rises, it cools very fast and the entire atmosphere topples. So you have colder air on the ground, right? And you have warmer air above. So in such a place, you'll find that the cold air would already, condensation would have taken place and it will already have formed into cloud and the entire cloud then appears to be on the ground. So to watch it happening, you should actually uh, keep awake in a one winter night, keep awake, especially when you know that mist and fog is happening and you can use a temperature thermometer and you know take temperatures and go on seeing and see. Suddenly you will find a drop in temperature and suddenly the mist will be there. So that's called as radiation fog. For that, the air has to be absolutely calm and still. If you have any wind or, or calm breeze blowing, that is the end of it. It'll just, it will just gets blown away and uh, the uh, temperature does not, the air will not it sort of, uh, it will become unstable. Okay. So also if you have a flattish land, a hollow land, then that's where it will happen more often. That is like a valley. Okay. And condensation then happens in the lower levels of rising air, and that's how. So this is that is radiation fog, and that is what we see everywhere in the world. Now, in some parts of the world, we have something called as advection fog. So we're coming across this word again. Advection is actually the movement, horizontal movement, right? So wind is also some kind of an advection, but in this case, what is happening is that there must be a a cold current flowing in the in the region and during the uh, uh, day right the temperatures will definitely be higher so the air becomes filled with moisture but at night which comes in quickly the cooling takes place very fast and then you'll find that because of the wind or because of the currents the fog sort of rolls in so it may have formed out at sea and then it rolls in and then that is called as an advection fog. So the fog is not formed in this place. It has come from some other place. And it is mainly occurs in the temperate latitudes. So wherever you have uh, creeks, you have creeks uh, are small inlets of the sea. Okay. So wherever you have creeks uh, and or rivers that are flowing out <coughs> from that region. So uh, by evening, you will find or by night time, the frog, fog will roll in like this, and that is called as an advection fog, right? So here, air chill from below, and you have cooler water, maybe because of a cold current, maybe because the it is winter, right? And that's how the fog comes into the land, right? Then we have something is called as frontal fog. For frontal fog, you need cold air meeting up with warm air. When the two meet, obviously, because the cold air is dry, the warm air will be moist. So condensation takes place at the ground level, at the point where the two meet, because uh, a cooling, and therefore that turns into fog. So that is generally the beginning of a tropical cyclone. When you have a fog like that, a frontal fog, it is the beginning of a, sorry, a mid-latitude cyclone, where the warm air is meeting with the cold air and then a lot of things happen and eventually you have a storm over the next three or four days may last a week or so and you have a, a, like you have blizzard conditions right people again life uh, comes to a standstill at that point but the fog is a like a uh, information for you saying that if if you have a fog when you are say around 55 degree north latitude then they know that what to expect in the next few days. Okay, right. Then you have steam fog. Warmer water, then you have colder air. So warmer water brought in by, say for example, the North Atlantic drift is bringing the warm water into the region. 
the surrounding air is cold in winter it is cold and so you will find that that the two meet the cold uh, the i mean the cold temperature decreases the temperature of the incoming air and then you have the formation of fog so if the temperature of the water is higher so in places where you have say um, volcanic areas so you have much warmer water there like around iceland then you have a lot of steam fog so steam fog is mainly also connected to much warmer water around the hawaiian region around the iceland okay where you have a lot of volcanic activity in the sea okay then you have upslope fog right so warm air forced to rise it cools and the term adiabatic and then if you have any resort or something there then you will have fog formed in that resort or house or wherever right so that's that's uh, actually not a uh, uh, cloud okay because in cloud the air will rise vertically vertically up this is going up slope going up the mountain right what what could force the air up the mountain is maybe winds if there is a strong wind blowing against this mountain then whatever little warm air will be forced to rise up right this way right and that uh, will lead to what we call as an up slope fog and this is what happens in the himalayas which is why they cannot climb up to the higher levels during the day okay and uh, yeah that's a yeah so then we have clouds so clouds basically are uh, different types of clouds we have three levels of clouds low clouds medium clouds and middle level clouds and high clouds and uh, the uh, basically how the con condensation happens that depends uh, where the condensation happen will decide what type of cloud so obviously if condensation happens at lower levels it means the air is still dense and therefore you have thicker clouds and as you go up the air is less and therefore you have thinner clouds right so since you have very thick clouds and the lower levels they look like thick sheets so we call them as stratus so stratus is the lowest cloud found around 2000 1000 2000 meters from the ground level from sea level right and if that goes slightly higher right it turns into what is called as cumulus cumulus is not here they should have had a cumulus there then if the cumulus it also has a flat so cumulus are other cotton shaped the uh, look just like rolls of cotton and keep changing shape right and they are actually fair weather clouds because they are as you go up it's less dense so then they spread out and they have various shapes and they are generally whitish in color right and if they have a flat base then you call them as stratocumulus now if the color of the cumulus changes or if the color of the stratus changes then we call it as nimbo stratus so nimbo is a word we normally use for rain okay so nimbo meaning it has more moisture it look darker in color right and that is your nimbo stratus so these names are uh, you can remember you may have studied them if you have not it doesn't matter it's quite simple right then as you go higher the air is less dense so now here whatever condensation happens it's not going to be that thick so if it is like small little cotton pieces then we call it as alto cumulus so alto there are no separate alto clouds the alto just means middle level here at a, at an altitude okay so we have alto cumulus and alto stratus so depending on the shape so if it is like small balls of cotton then we call it as alto cumulus if it is flattish then we call it as alto stratus and actually just after the monsoon if you look at the sky you can see all these clouds from stratus the stratus clouds will come in very fast and you can actually see this so in the month of after the monsoon not before the monsoon so in the month of august september is when you need to look at the sky and you can see all these levels actually all the and you can identify the height also because of that then as you go higher it's much more uh, denser and it's much more cold so the water particles there are then in formed in the form of ice right so if they are flattish and together together a little bit dense then it's called as cirrus so these are the cirrus clouds so this flattish it is called as cirrostratus 
if it is uh, hazy, very wispy, like you know, uh, like if you take cotton and you can separate it out in as thin as possible, then that is your cirrus cloud. Sometimes you may have like in uh, just like uh, you have alto cumulus, just like that you will have smaller little like uh, uh, cotton kind of thing, but they're much smaller, and it looks like the scales of a fish. So that is uh, called a cirro cumulus, right? So the mackerel, I think if you've seen a mackerel fish, you know, you see the scales, that's what it appears. And that's why when the uh, fishermen see this in the sky, they say, oh, it's a mackerel sky. So today we use that word mackerel sky. And so if you see the clouds, mackerel sky in the evening, it is likely to rain in the morning, it's likely to have a storm, right? So those are the clouds that we have on the left. Now on the right, we have this cumulonimbus. Now the cumulonimbus cloud is generally formed only under specific conditions in specific places. In three places in the world, one is almost every day in the equatorial region. So here is where we are focusing on a large volume of air holding lots of moisture becoming extremely hot and rising. So when you have these three conditions, large volume, having higher temperatures and having lots of moisture, when it rises up and it starts to cool, initially you'll have a stratus created. Then as you go up higher, it will become, because the density of uh, the air is less, so then it will become cumulus. And it will remain cumulus because this is a large volume of air. And as you grow up to the higher level, then there is a point beyond which the clouds will not go up further because it's absolutely cold there and it flattens out and that is called as the anvil head. So an anvil head cloud also called as cumulonimbus. So why is it called cumulonimbus? Because 100% you are likely to get rainfall where these clouds develop, right? Now, what else is associated with these clouds? you also have lightning and thunder, okay? I won't say thunder and lightning because that's not really correct. It is lightning and thunder. So in school, I don't know what you have studied about lightning and thunder. Uh, they may have told you that when two clouds come close to each other or when they clash, then that's when you would have thunder and lightning. But actually what is happening here is this. As the moisture and the water vapor and the molecules of air rise up, they get ionized they, due to friction. And as they get ionized, some particles will become negatively charged, some particles will become positively charged. Now, as it goes higher, I told you it gets colder. So in this cloud, within the cloud, the cold air comes down, pushing up the warm air. And in this, you'll find that you have an unequal distribution of your charged particles. So if one part of the cloud is more, has more positive charge, comes into contact with another part of the cloud which is less positively charged or more negatively charged, then the charge jumps from the positive part to the negative and that's when you have the lightning. Now, this lightning is at a temperature of 6,000 degrees Celsius. So, at that temperature, the air around the lightning, I mean, sort of blasts, explodes. And that is the explosion that you hear as thunder. So, lightning and thunder happen simultaneously. But you see the lightning first because light travels faster than sound, right? But this is the reason why you have lightning and thunder, right? So this one region where you have lightning and thunder is in the equatorial regions. Then sometimes the monsoon cloud is a cumulonimbus cloud. Mostly it is nimbostratus. Mostly 100% it is nimbostratus. But sometimes it may, like for example, pre-monsoon stars are all cumulonimbus. Then in India, we also have 
this April Shahs. The April Shahs are also because it is similar to your equatorial uh, situation. And so you have this cumulonimbus. And cumulonimbus is also formed sometimes in the cyclones, both tropical cyclone and mid-latitude cyclone, right? So that's your cumulonimbus cloud, and it's not a very common phenomena. And then you may also have hail here. Why do you have hail? If the uh, air is rising very rapidly, it then cools also very rapidly. Remember, I talked to you about adiabatic cooling, where you have uh, the air cooling at the rate of 10 degrees Celsius for every one kilometer, 1,000 meters. Okay. So in this case, if the air is rising rapidly, then sometimes the temperature is 17 degrees. So supposing it is 35 degrees in the first kilometer, 35 minus 17, or they get the first two kilometers is already reached one degree Celsius. Another 1,000 meters, it is below, way below zero. So ice, the water droplets uh, or the water vapor sometimes super cool and go straight to form into hail. Very, very tiny pieces of ice which keep on being pushed up because it's so light and because there is this updraft that the air is rising, hot air is rising up. And then they become bigger and bigger and bigger. And last year, I think, uh, last year or year before last, I think we had huge ice uh, hail, hail even here in India, large pieces, right? And the reason is because of the super cooling, right? And that's what is associated with cumulonimbus cloud. So this is a season where you would have this kind of features created, right? So this is the last form of uh, uh, this thing. So now, when you have condensation, obviously you are going to have precipitation, right? So precipitation here is when water droplets form into water particles, right? So, sorry, from water vapor. From, from water vapor, you have water droplets, right? And the initial size will be very small, about 0.1 millimeter, very small size, okay? Then they turn in, then that, that is what forms the clouds, the mist, the fog, okay? When they increase in size, how do they increase in size? They normally coalesce, they join up together. So they increase in size from 0.5 to 2 millimeters, then we call them as raindrops. So it is 0.5, generally it's light rainfall, very small, what we call as a drizzle, and two millimeters is heavy rainfall, okay? The main difference between condensation and precipitation is the size of the water droplets. So the condensation, it is always going to be 0.1 millimeters. But precipitation, the size will begin to increase. And then, so what is the meaning of the word precipitation? Is that when the, uh, when the condensed water begins to move downwards or fall, okay, in different forms, then we call that as precipitation. The condensation, it still remains floating in the air, whether it is at ground level, whether it is above level. And of course, uh, when it uh, condensation happens directly on the ground, it's not falling. It is just happening directly on the ground because of contact, con conduction mainly and contact. So that that is when we call them as dew. But when it is happening just in the air around us and it is floating around, then that is condensation, right? Only when the water falls through the atmosphere, generally it's at a height because it comes only from clouds, that's when you have precipitation, right? So that's the main difference between condensation and precipitation. Then the formation and processes here. So first air has to cool, okay? Then you had condensation and cloud formation. And then you have accumulation of moisture. And finally, the growth of the cloud droplets as they all the droplets join up together, right? And then you have the form of rain. So there are some factors for the formation of rainfall. One is air pressure. So there should be a difference in air pressure so that either air is moving in or air is moving out. So there should be zones of convergence or divergence. Mostly, there should be zones of 
convergence, okay, because of the air pressure. Then you will find that along with uh, the convergence, right, you also have convection, especially in the low pressure belts. So low pressure belts where the air is rising up and, and you know, the cold air is coming down and hot air is rising up, that kind of cooling is happening along the process of convection, right? Then you will find that the rising air begins to cool and you have the formation of clouds, okay? Once you have the formation of clouds, then it may be possible that some of the air, sorry, uh, some of the air that cools and then you may have the formation of water droplets and then you have precipitation, right? In a high pressure zone, unfortunately, the uh, precipitation will not happen because the air is now moving downwards. And when it is moving downwards, therefore, the increasing in temperature and therefore condensation is just, uh, just stops. So as air rises up and then comes down also, you can expect condensation to disappear. Okay, right. So this is just general information that just the formation of uh, this thing, I'm going to do types of rainfall. So this is just information on where in the world we have lots of rainfall. So one is abundant rainfall in equatorial regions, which is the Amazon basin, all along the doldrum region or low pressure zone. Here is where you have the convergence of two winds which is the trade winds. I told you about the ITCZ yesterday, the intertropical convergence zone. And then you need to have high temperatures here, right? And that promotes the strong convective uplift. So there should be uplift of air so that it cools, right? And whether it happens due to convection or advection or frontal or whichever way or, or blockage by mountain something, you find that you need to be for it to be pushed up, right? Very hot air to be pushed up, right? And therefore, you have warm, uh, and then of course comes into uh, contact with the warm equatorial air coming from the sea or bringing a lot of moisture, right? And that's why you have high rainfall here. Then areas of abundant ra rainfall are mainly the western sides of the middle latitude. That's all the areas that are affected by the westerly winds. So there are lots of rainfall. When I say abundant rain, so very high rainfall is above maybe 400 centimeters of rainfall. 200 to 400 centimeters on the western side, especially if you have winds blowing in from that side, then these are where you have abundant rainfall. So in India, it is along the western Ghats and it is the, uh, the northern part of the western Ghats. The southern part receives very abundant rainfall. Northeastern states also receive very high rainfall. Okay, so western coast of Canada, U USA, and Europe is where we have lots of rainfall, and the rainfall is throughout the year. Okay, then under influence of onshore westerlies and frequent frontal, this is the reason why we are having heavy rainfall there. The winds are always blowing from the uh, sea to the land throughout the year, one, and then you have uh, the meeting of uh, warm air and cold air and you have these mid-latitude or frontal cyclones, okay? Then western mountains like along the Rockies, the west coast and even like I said, west coast of India where you have the mountains blocking it and therefore you have plenty of rainfall throughout the year. Of course, in India, it is seasonal, okay? Then zones of scanty rainfall are places which are extremely cold because there can be no evaporation here. Polar areas of North America, which is mainly Northern Canada, Alaska, Northern Europe, Norway, Sweden, Northern parts of Russia, and in the Southern hemisphere, it is Antarctica. And of course, the top of all the mountains, right? So air with low moisture content and low temperature, unfavorable for evaporation. Descending cold air, upper air masses will also be unfavorable because already it is dry. So when it comes down and even if it heats up, there is no condensation because there is no moisture left in the air. Okay. And finally, you have places where you have deserts, uh, conditions where you have desert forming condition due to high pressure, 
due to uh, being far away from the influence of the winds, okay, or uh, being extremely cold. The, we have three types of deserts, right? Hot desert, mid-latitude desert, and cool deserts. Okay, so these are the, uh, the zones. Then 25 to 30 degrees, these are the areas of the deserts, north and south that we have done on all sides except Europe. Europe is the only co continent that does not have a desert. Right, it, it is almost completely in the belt of the westerly winds, and uh, even if you go interior, it, that becomes Asia. As you go further interior beyond the Ural Mountains, it then becomes Asia. So whole of Europe does not have a single desert. Okay, then 30 degrees to 40 degrees north southwestern USA. Okay, that's the uh, uh, Mojave Desert and Sonoran Desert we talked about yesterday affected by the subtropical -tropi anticyclone. I, will, I won't explain that here. And then the rain shadow region. So rain shadow means the opposite side of the winds where you have the Chinook winds, you have the Booth winds, right? Those are the areas that will, will have very scanty rainfall. And uh, we have that in India. So the Western Ghats from north to south uh, on the opposite side in the plateau is pretty dry. Okay? Right. So... Uh, we move on to the last topic. So any doubts up to this point? I think these are much easier topics and uh, some concepts have been repeated so it would be easier for you to understand. I hope you are making a note of uh, doubts if you have any doubts. All right. And uh, you can clear it at the end of this class. So the final topic here is all related to condensation where we started off in the last uh, topic and types of rainfall. So you may wonder what do you mean by actually types of rainfall? So we need to know how it rains. So one, sun has to shine. If the sun shines, the warm air rises. So the ground becomes hot. Right? First the sun shines and the ground or the water becomes hot. Then the land becomes hot. Uh, air above it becomes hot. And then the air rises. Now when it rises, it cools. When it cools, condensation happens and therefore clouds form, right? And as the cloud becomes thicker, you then have rain. Mm -hmm. So this is the general principle for all types of rainfall. So when I'm talking of types of rainfall here, I'm talking of types where I'm looking at what we call as a trigger factor that gives you the name of the type. So what is it that is causing the air to rise. Something should uh, make the force the air to rise. Right? So that will then give you the type, the name of the type of rainfall. Okay. So let's begin with the first. So you need a trigger, some trigger to allow the air. The air has to rise for any purpose. The air and that also warm and moist air. It should not be just warm air. It should be warm, moist air. Okay. It has to rise. It has to go up. And what we need something to make it go up. So in the first one, we have convectional rainfall. So convectional rainfall, same thing. Sun rays heat up the ground and then warm air rises up, water vapor. Now what's the important thing here is that convectional rainfall happens in the same place. It's not as if it's happening you know, somewhere else and then it is brought in. No. In the same place, the ground is getting hot or the, then the air gets hot and then that air goes up, rises, cools down, forms a cloud and then drops the rainfall in the same place. So mainly it happens in India, like I told you, it happens in central India, late afternoon, okay? Uh, especially in this season, we call it as the mango showers and the... Kalbai Saki and Bardoli Chirha. We have several names in India. And you would have, uh, you know, seen it in the news that, you know, they are they also known as mango shahs. So either they favor the crop or they spoil the crop. So we have blossom shah that is uh, favors the uh, blossoms of the coffee, which is only found in Kerala and parts of Karnataka. That's a cool area in Karnataka. <clears throat> and then we have the uh, mango shahs, which is right across the peninsula region, right? And it's supposed to favor the mango crop. If it comes too early, it will destroy the crop. But if it comes a little later, 
it will actually improve the crop. So that's why they just just generally gave the name mango mango shas. And then you have something called Bardoli Chira and uh, Kalbai Sati, which are very strong winds that are found in northeast India. Now at this point of time, so watching the news, you know that you have thunder stars. Uh, so it may even you may even have hail. This year in uh, Bangalore, the we didn't have uh, that much of uh, like uh, the hailstorm or thunderstorm. It hasn't yet started for some reason. Okay. The clouds build up, it's cloudy, but it doesn't seem like a cumulonimbus cloud. But remember, this is all cumulonimbus cloud. So when you have rain like this, it is only from the cumulonimbus cloud, right? And that is called as convection. So found only in the tropical regions, not found uh, anywhere else. Then, then we come to the next one. Convection or rainfall, the same thing I have just informed. So this is how... You have warm air rising up, cold air pushed out in the same place, right? And then you have the formation of the cumulus cloud. That's the ionization that happens because of updraft and downdraft. So you have got positive charge and negative charge. And if they two, if the two come close to each other, you have a jump and you have lightning, right? Lightning, thunder, hail is all associated with this particular one. Then the second type is relief rainfall. This again also you would have learned. It's also called as orographic rainfall. So here water is evaporating from the ocean into the air and that air is rising up and then it blows towards the land. As it blows towards the land, it cools down, forms into your cloud, okay, and then it begins to rain. But further cooling leads to precipitation. So it's raining there at the top of the mountain. It can rain anywhere on the left side, which is the windward side. Okay. So here is where the rainfall will vary. So initially, lower regions will receive 1,000 millimeters, that is 100 centimeters. Then as you go up, the rainfall will increase. But if you go on the other side of the mountain, you will have less rainfall. Right. So this is what happens in the mountains in the west coast of India, right? And we say this is the rainy side or the windward side the, from where the winds are coming. So these are the southwest monsoon winds that are blowing in here. And then the opposite side is called as a rain shadow or leeward side, right? So these are terms you should be familiar with in general. So uh, it can be applied to a lot of other things also, okay? <clears throat> so that's your uh, also called as relief rainfall, right? So all, the another term for relief rainfall is orographic rain. And this is only explaining it to you as to how it happens. Saturated air mass comes across a mountain barrier. So in, in the world, the important mountain barriers are one, the Western Ghats in India. <clears throat> then you have the Andes and Rocky Mountains in North and South America. Okay, so as it rises, it expands, temperature drops, dew point is reached, condensation is happening, rain cloud is forming, and the windward slope receives rainfall. As the clouds blow over, they either come down, they decrease in, in height, they come down and then increase in temperature, or they lost the rainfall in the on the windward side, and therefore the leeward slope gets less rain, right? And this is also called as the rain shadow area. Okay, I hope uh, this is clear. I'm not going too fast on this. Right. The third type of rainfall is what we were talking about earlier. Frontal or temperate or mid-latitude rainfall. Okay. And we generally call this a cyclone. So in this case, what's happening? I have warm, moist air coming in. Okay. And meeting up with cold air. So now I have the meeting point of both are, is called as a front. So the warm, the front of the warm air is called the warm front and the front of the cold air is called as a cold front. Okay. So what happens is that the warm air is light. The cold air is heavy and dense. So warm air is now the trigger factor here is forced to rise. And as it forced to rise, it cools down. 
and then the same process condenses forms clouds and you have rainfall now what is happens here is that that the rain falls through a cold very cold air mass and when it forms through the cold air mass here is where you will find you have a different kind of precipitation so you know of snowfall you know of rain you know snow okay uh, but there is a combination of rain snow and you know hail right so a combination of all these three is then called as um, uh, sleet okay so sleet here is doesn't really it has uh, uh, i mean when you have the warm air come into contact with the cold air at that point of time you may have the formation of uh, snow then if the water is too thick and there is no time for it to become into ice and it falls through the cold air it then freezes in the form of tiny needle shaped ice okay and that is hail that actually is a part of uh, hail but it is needle shaped so you have rain also falling very heavy drops which will, will not cool down because they are falling with such force there is no time for it to cool down you have heavy rain drops you have needle shaped ice and you have snow and you will have a strong wind because when you have the meeting of warm and cold you will find that the warm air cold air will push up into the warm air and push it down right and so you may have the formation of a cumulonimbus cloud here because that warm air uh, will be when it is pushed upwards by the cold air or the cold air is moving depends on how what is happening within the cold air also right you may have the formation of a cumulonimbus but mostly it is a thick cloud and you have the formation of sleet right so uh, sleet here i have pictures in another which i will probably do tomorrow uh, in terms of types of uh, uh, this thing so we have three types of rainfall here the orographic uh, rainfall okay and uh, yeah so where where does this happen frontal air rainfall happens only in the temperate latitudes mid latitude okay cold air from the polar regions meet the warm moist air from the tropical regions and as they meet the warm air is forced to rise up creating a frontal area so frontal area basically means the meeting of warm front with the cold front right so cold air mass comes uh, closer to the warm air mass and it intensifies into a stormy condition and this uplift then causes uh, when the uh, i mean the warm air actually is suddenly made to lift off a low pressure is created on the ground so the cold air immediately takes the place and there is displacement of air so the warm air goes over it and then you find that there is a convection that actually happens here initially you have a stratus cloud form and then you have cumulus and then you have the development of cumulonimbus over a period of time right and you will have snow hail sleet and uh, rain right all falling in the same place right so this is what happens here you have the warm air going up that ca cb is an, is in numbers that we give sorry alphabets that we give to clouds so cb is cumulonimbus cs is cirrostratus then ac here is alto cumulus and the lower should be stratus which is s okay and that is how you have rainfall happening so the rainfall here will happen in the region of the cold air the warm air region will be nice and clear right and it is only the place where the cold air has come in right that is the region where you will find you have the uh, uh, a combination so actually the situation here nowadays is becoming really bad and really intense so we have something called as a blizzard so in a blizzard you will find that you ca cannot even go out because the wind speeds are very high and remember the you have uh, ice needle shaped ice coming in so to you take your umbrella and go out it will just be full of uh, holes 
okay and it will just fly off also so people are generally advised not to go out during such a stormy condition right and it happens frequently in the mid latitude new york uh, the entire belt of new york chicago that entire region great lakes as you go on and again in the western uh, europe region in U in the uk france germany so you have this warm air and cold air meeting there are no mountains to block it so they happily meet up and uh, that's what you have okay right so this is uh, again another uh, uh, pictures just to explain what happens right of how the warm air is rising up and you have it. actually you cannot see anything no you know, around you you can only feel a drop in the air temperature that's all you can you can't see anything and it may be a little misty if it's very cold you it may be a little misty but normally cold air is dry so you may not even see the mist coming in from the easterly winds so from the polar easterlies right so this is the uh, what we call as a, a drawing or a made on a weather map and i was talking of isobars so the curved lines that you see are all the isobars so in this case the sharp blue is basically the cold front right and the red is the warm front so the warm air is coming on the right and it is coming towards this so this is in stage 3 after the two have met then you will find that the cold air pushes the warm front right and the air continues to rise so that rising air you just have the formation of stratus clouds strato cumulus clouds cumulus clouds and then you have the nimbo stratus so all the cloud formations will happen over a period of time right and uh, uh, it can be quite huge as you can see below the linear scale given there it can go from 100 uh, uh, this is nautical miles right and uh, which is more than a normal mile and or a kilometer and that's how you can go up to 1000 miles right and uh, what when does the whole thing just disappear so when both converge both will move continue to move each other and when both finally like uh, become the same temperature the whole thing disappears and that is called as occlusion right and uh, so as you can see the movement of the arrow shows you how the winds are working yeah so finally we move on to the last one which is tropical cyclone that is important over uh india also important in the Atl south atlantic ocean sorry north atlantic ocean uh in south usa and uh, then you have uh, japan sea of japan and sea of china and also in australia so here is basically that these are violent storms right and uh, uh, they are associated with lots of rainfall you have you may have lightning thunder all right and they are known by different names right but you definitely have heavy rainfall and storm surges which i'll explain in a while uh so these cyclones are basically called by different names so this question has come frequently so they call as hurricanes in atlantic including the hawaiian islands then typhoons in the west pacific which is uh, japan china south china sea willy willies in western australia right so these are the names Uh, that are given to the cyclones now how do these cyclones occur this is a picture of the cyclone which was called as sandy which reached right up to new york so as you can see here in this picture the difference between the previous cyclone that you saw the mid latitude so there it just two uh, zones meeting two air masses meeting cold and warm in this case here you have the entire air circulating right so how does this circulation happen and how is it that in the center there are hardly any clouds which are known as the so we have the spiral formation so the eye of the storm how is it that it is not having that many clouds okay so so this is how the cyclone is developed so initially you have a low pressure area in the center so the center here with the curved lines right that is the eye 
that is a low pressure area and it is generally found in the sea so for that to happen the temperature of the sea should be at least 27 degrees so when would the sea reach that temperature of 27 degrees is after summer so the moment you have you know a small cell of low pressure the atmosphere is huge and anything happens in it so one small cell of uh, low pressure maybe even a, just a 100 kilometers wide a circular cell and it's surrounded by high pressure on all sides or of a higher pressure than all sides immediately air will begin to move from the high pressure to the low pressure now the surrounding area is much larger in size when compared to the size of the the initial low pressure circle so therefore it cannot accommodate so much air so the trigger factor here is just that because the air cannot be accommodated in this it will sort of pile up and that's why it begins to rise up so you can see these bands of air rising up those bands of air rising up is because there's no place for the air to go so now these are warm rise up right and as they rise up they then form and then this so uh, i was also say that this air uh, this low uh, pressure center is not like you know staying in one place it moves it's because it's like a bubble it's like a yeah, you 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 all blow soap bubbles and you see how it moves so for some reason it moves over the sea and therefore the whole system moves and as the whole system moves it becomes more and more intense right and so it becomes one huge mass of what you see here uh, so you have a low pressure cell high pressure areas right and then you have the cumulonimbus cloud form right and then you have heavy rainfall so the rainfall will begin out at sea but as it moves towards the land then it's the outer areas that bring a lot of rainfall okay so that's how the rainfall is created and since it is a moving system the wind speed because all the air is rushing towards the low pressure the wind speed is pretty high now what happens in the center now since the air is not able to around is not able to reach the center it's going up and then it descends in downwards into the center and we just talk about descending air drying up so even though it may have a lot of moisture and the moisture may have been lost also by then as it descends it's not going to only lose the moisture is going to increase in temperature and therefore it before it can uh, it will continue to sort of maintain that low pressure so the whole thing disappears only when the eye of that cyclone meets with the land because the land air pressure is different and therefore when that happens is like you know somebody poking the uh, balloon with a pointed thing and it bursts and immediately the whole system disappears right so that's your tropical cyclone and this is uh, the uh, image created in the lab for uh, how the air is moving up right the bands how are the bands created and you have warm air the lower regions are all warm air not yet condensed but as it moves up it condenses and you have the formation of clouds and it is a circle circular formation like that right so that's your formation of the tropical cyclone so in in the world in the month of august september you find temperatures begin to rise october november you have the formation of the cyclones and then the cyclones hit the east coast of india the east coast of usa in the south mainly east coast of south usa because that's a tropical regions right the east coast of south china sea south china uh, region japan and so on and then further in in uh, what you call uh, in australia it is uh, since the direction of the winds is different there right it is mainly on in the north the so northern australia witnesses a uh, cyclone there because the shape of australia again is different so because india is in the shape of a triangle 
and uh, we we also have another situation in india where the bay of bengal is uh, has uh, what you call a sweeter water than the uh, arabian sea so arabian sea is more salty because it has very few rivers that fall into it it is surrounded by deserts in the north especially and in the west and partly in the east so therefore the uh, waters there though it is warmer it is also more saline because it's not really fresh so it takes a long time for that water to heat up and a long time for that water to uh, cool down but arabian sea is more of fresh water you have all the uh, rivers big rivers of india right uh, the, all the five peninsula river, rivers then ganga brahmaputra then the rivers from uh, myanmar and uh, uh, indonesia heavy rainfall region lot of fresh water flowing into this region cambodia thailand all these rivers flowing into this region and the water is sweeter so it cools up cools quickly it heats up quickly and so there are more cyclones here and of course uh, the temperatures have to quickly reach 27 degrees it takes a longer time in the arabian sea so that is why arabian sea does not have that many cyclones at the same time we have a change in the wind direction at that in that season the wind becomes northeast trades so if any cyclones are formed in the arabian sea they will be pushed away from india whereas in the arabian uh, bay of bengal they are pushed towards india of course most of these cyclones also have their own path they don't follow the wind path the wind just gives them a kind of a, a push and then they just circulate and it's all in a like uh, anti clockwise direction so it goes against the wind right in an anti clockwise swirling 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 so sometimes when it's supposed to hit uh, tamil nadu it goes and hits orissa or it goes and hits west bengal or it goes and hits uh, myanmar or bangladesh bangladesh is the biggest uh, uh, i mean the, the the most hit country by these cyclones right and that's how you have uh, these cyclones created in these parts and of course you have cyclones in uh, the uh, southern part of usa uh, called hurricanes and and they are more disastrous because you see open ocean there right and the wind speed is, is steady you have the gulf stream there hot water coming in adding and fuel to the evaporation rates uh, to the temperature of the ocean and so that is why hurricanes are like really hit harder than the tropical cyclones right but now with climate change and increase in temperature we are just actually moving towards more of uh, super cyclones and so on and so now what happens when the low pressure reaches the sea now the condition on the left you can see these are normal condition the cyclone has not reached now when the cyclone is arriving the low pressure actually in the low pressure the sea is lifted up because it's low pressure less air so the sea tries to take in sort of sucks up the sea water so when it is coming towards the land this sucked up water is then picked up and then thrown on the land very similar to what we call as a tsunami except that the waves are not very high right and it is only limited to that area of the cyclone it won't be found everywhere and that is what is called as a storm surge so a storm surge can happen in any cyclone whether it is tropical or mid latitude right and a lot of things have been done to stop that storm storm that cyclone right uh, most of orissa was odisha was destroyed in 1996 i think this is a super cyclone the sea water came in is a flat land narmada uh, uh, sorry the mahanadi basin it's a flat land the salt water sea water came in to 100 km and completely destroyed the fresh water the storm surge can destroy a lot of things and can we stop it no but we can create barriers of some sort in london they have created a barrier the london barrier that closes and keeps the storm surge out otherwise the all the areas along the river thames on which london is built around it get completely flooded out so they have got these huge things that stop the storm surge okay so with that we finish we just have a few minutes more for any questions
Any questions? Yeah, ma'am. I had a question. Yes. Does, uh, does this uh, global warming, all these environmental aspects, uh, uh, does source any result in uh, cyclones and rains? Yes. Because global warming means increase in temperature, right? Yeah. So when I say increase in, so there is this concept where uh, because of the increase in temperature of the water, so when water increases in temperature, it tends to expand. That is why when milk is boiling, it, it goes up, right? And it falls out. So water tends to expand. So this expansion of water will create uh, flooding of low-lying regions. So the, that increase in temperature is not only of the air, it is also, uh, it's, it's, it's not that the sunlight has become stronger, it's the air that is much stronger, right? So that heat that is around is also absorbed by land as well as the, uh, the sea. On land, the glaciers will melt, right? And in the sea, the water expands. So this rise in temperature will definitely create more storms and it may dry up some areas more than before. So we need to have a, a, a do a big serve. Nobody is even thinking about it. In India, we expect the global warming impact to start in another, uh, already it is 2025. So by 2050, uh, most of the coastal parts of India will be disappeared. So when I do India, I will be doing all those con contemporary topics. We'll see how the shape of India will change. Right, and uh, East India is going to be affected more than West India. Right? Uh, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. So you're going to have more of heavy rainfall. I didn't talk about cloud burst. Uh, cloud burst is what we are having happening more frequently. It's a bit more complex. So for cloud burst, uh, if you're interested, I can do a separate topic on that because that will. That involves uh, other concepts such as the jet stream and uh, the formation of uh, the various things in the upper atmosphere, which is not a part of your uh, syllabus. But if you do uh, geography, uh, then then you get to study that. Any others? No other questions? Easier topic? Was this easier? Yes, no? This one topic is, a, topic is easy, but you are going a little bit fast. I'm still going fast? Yeah, ma'am. So I'm are you people this. taking notes? Yeah, yes, ma'am, I was taking notes. I'm okay, going. okay. So actually, yeah, so if you told me that, yeah, today I've gone much slower. But uh, if you want, if you want more of notes, because I know my uh, this thing has more of a presentation, has more of slides, and the oral uh, exp explanation. But if you are taking notes, then I will uh, I will make my presentation with more of notes. Actually, there are uh, notes that have already been prepared and that may be shared with you. Okay, so uh, that is both for uh, mainly uh, geography of India and uh, uh, not so much for physical geography. So I can, I'm in the process of making those more for physical geography. So, yeah, uh, okay, I'll go slower. I think I'll make, uh, uh, instead of talking too much, I'll also show you more of the notes so that you can take down key points. Okay? Uh, what you need to remember is just certain key things. That's it, you don't need to remember everything. The thing is, if you understand the sentence you're reading in the in your uh, uh, in the question paper, that is more important than actually mugging up. Now, nowadays they're not giving up that much information where you have to remember so much detail. So when you, when you get the sentence immediately, you will know, understand that sentence. You know whether it is correct, it's not correct, and uh, so on and so forth. So that's the basic concepts I'm focusing on. And, yeah. Okay, so tomorrow's uh, this thing I'll try and uh, 
give you more of written information. Right? Any questions? Sorry, Madam. Actually, uh, actually, I 